This week, Evan and Michael put on masks and stood around watching teenagers. And after the police were called, they went home and watched Halloween. Welcome back to How Did You Miss This? A show where we take a stab at increasing our movie watching body count. I'm Evan Toller Hickey, and with me as always, Michael Hansen and Krista Shane. And today, we are nearly wrapping up Scaretober by watching the OG slasher film that launched a thousand cuts. Yes, it is 1978's Halloween. Uh, this is one of the most important horror films ever made. In fact, it is in the uh, Library of Congress because uh, it is culturally and historically and uh, and or aesthetically significant. So I guess that begs the question, Michael, how did you miss this? I wasn't old enough to watch it when it came out. And then later, when I was old enough, I think this movie was too old for me. And there were new things to watch. There were other things to see. And uh, in fact, the first Halloween movie I ever watched was the the reboot uh, from what, 2017, 2018. And that was my first experience. So to have watched them in that order was an interesting experience. Now, Chris, you have seen this film. Um, I, I'm curious, what's your relationship to it? Uh, I mean, not not a favorite. I saw all of these when I mean, I, I guess me seeing horror movies is the equivalent of a Swedish kid seeing everything else, because uh, I saw this and, and, you know, Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street and all those things probably. I don't know, by the time I was 10. So saw these on home video and I don't know. I mean, uh, slasher movies were a big part of my early, uh, early days of, of movie watching. That being said, this is not something that I've probably seen in 20 or 25 years. So it's been quite a while for me. Uh, but what about you, Evan? You, you missed this. So how about yourself? Yeah. You know, as much as a horror fan as I am, slasher is not a, a subgenre that I'm super stoked to watch at any given time. And so I just kind of never got around to this. So I'm very curious to talk about it. I, I think it will be a very interesting conversation. And, and and I will say, like, this is unlike a lot of the, the horror movies that we do see. Like, this is one of the few, you know, independently produced films mm -hmm. of that era. And I mean, a lot of this gets started as a result of um, the relationship that John Carpenter has with uh, Erwin Yablons, who's the producer of this film. So uh, this is written by John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. The original idea was pitched by Yablons, who was like, hey, how about we do a scary ho thing with teenagers getting killed on the scariest day of the year? And he wanted to kind of make it like a radio play where there's lots of build up and tension kind of throughout, but not so much gore and that kind of stuff. This is the third movie that John Carpenter had directed. The previous two were made on like shoestring budgets, barely, you know, got any release or distribution. Uh, that's actually how uh, Carpenter met Yablins. And then this is kind of the launch pad, not only for um, Carpenter, who goes on after this to make a whole bunch of, you know, very 80s movies, right? He goes on to make The Thing and Escape from New York and a bunch of other, you know, successful movies in the 80s. Uh, it's also the launch pad for Deborah Hill, who became a very, very successful movie producer. Uh, she went on to make stuff like uh, Clue and The Fisher King and a whole bunch of other stuff. So this is a real launch pad for a bunch of these folks. It's also a launch pad for uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, because this is her first, uh, first, you know, film role out there. But I think, I think the amazing thing is, is like, this is a movie that got made for three hundred thousand dollars and to put that in perspective like jaws 2 that was made the same year was made for 20 million like if you if you inflate that three hundred thousand to current day money that's a million dollars today which is like virtually nothing yeah i mean that that sort of like low budget aesthetic definitely comes across in the film and and i will say like 
not in a bad way. Like it, I think it, it, it actually kind of helps the film. And, and I think that that may be why the film really kind of caught because yeah, it was like $300,000, but it makes like $70 million after it's released. And that makes it one of the most successful independent horror, well, independent films of all time, you know, and, and getting out right before Halloween, 1978, small market, um, just a few screens. And then it's sort of like that, that word of mouth happens. And this is something that we've seen a couple of times with the, the movies that we've been watching for Scaretober. And then it moves into larger markets and it just keeps building and building and building. And by, Halloween 1979. So almost a full year after, I mean, this film is absolutely massive and sets the the template for the masked killer kind of movie. And, and not just that, but sets the template for uh, the Halloween franchise, because I think there's, there's what, like 13 of these movies. Yeah. Once you include all, all the reboots and sequels and yeah, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch. And I mean, it's 40, 45 years or whatever of, of movies that have come out of kind of this one, you know, low budget, throw it together and then figure out how to distribute it after the, the, the studios aren't interested and, you know, somehow spawns this massive franchise that's lasted, you know, nearly 50 years, which is pretty wild. And I think the, the thing is too, is, um, you know, as much as people kind of originally sleep on this, because it's, again, like you said, like only in a couple small markets and, um, you know, gradually rolling out, the critics ignored this initially too, because, you know, not many people are seeing it. But once it does uh, get out there, um, you know, it starts to get those reviews. It starts be becoming a little bit of one of these cultural phenomenons that we've kind of talked about because suddenly everybody's passing it on through word of mouth. And then, you know, the critics start showing up as well. Um, you know, when Roger Ebert saw it, he, he called it a visceral experience uh, that we aren't seeing the movie. We're having it happen to us. Uh, but like, you know, some other mixed reviews where um, Gene Arnold of the Washington press uh, says, uh, since there's precious little care, Character or plot development to pass the time between stalking sequences, one tends to wish the killer would just get on with it. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> it's you, you've got kind of these two big extremes of how people were feeling about it, right? Like it's slow paced and trying to build this tension, but nothing's kind of happening. Or, you know, you really do feel that that tension or whatever throughout the movie. Uh, that's obviously going to be something that we're going to be talking about. But it's not just you know, the critical reviews and the, the success, but like, like you said, Evan, this is, this is a movie that spawns a thousand copies. Like literally Friday, the 13th is made the next year where people were like, Holy moly, Halloween's making a lot of mo money. We should make a movie just like that. Like, okay. Copy paste set in a slightly different place, get a killer with a mask off we go. Right. Um, so I mean, it, it is pretty wild. And the thing I found insanely wild about this is that this is a movie that has a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. Shocking. Shocking. That it has that much more than The Exorcist blows my mind. So I, you know, with that in mind, 96% people saying that this is like a near perfect film um, or, or one of the greatest films ever. Michael. Are you happy that you watched this film? I am not. I I disliked everything about this movie, even more so than, than I may have mentioned before. I thought it was an utterly terrible movie. There was nothing enjoyable about this at all. But I keep coming back to one of our ideas around this podcast when we started was, is it still good? Is it still worth watching? And this one I can say, spoiler alert, it is not. Super important, and I think we... We will have to, and I will as well, talk about how important this movie is for future ones. But enjoyable? No, I'm not glad I watched it. I think it is a terrible movie, and and no, I, I did not enjoy it at all. How about you, Chris, returning to this movie? Uh, I mean, I didn't love this movie. I think, uh, what's the right way to put this? I think this movie is an accomplishment knowing everything I know about it, right? Super low budget, independently distributed, you know, 
that is an accomplishment. And the fact that this is like such a, a thing that turns into 40 years of slasher movies is pretty amazing. But like watching this movie itself, uh, like it feels like I'm watching Sharknado or something that is like making fun of the show. It's like watching Scream 25 years later or whatever. Right. Where it's almost like a parody of the genre at this point, because it is all of the tropes of this style of movie, except it's one of the very earliest to do it. Anyway, um, Evan, what about you? How, how do you feel visiting this movie for the first time? Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm kind of decidedly mixed on it. It I'm glad that I've seen it now, but it, it was more academic for me than anything else. Did I enjoy this movie? Not particularly. Do I enjoy watching like a primary source of something uh, just purely for my own edification? Yeah. So like the the sort of like geek in me is like, cool. I'm really glad I've seen that. But the sort of like the the aesthetic part of me is like, I probably could have spent 90 minutes doing something else. Well, I think we are going to have a lot to talk about, and uh, maybe that's a good spot to take a brief intermission, and then we can get into why we thought what we did about this movie. Well, uh, spoiler warning, I guess. But if you've ever seen a slasher movie, uh, you probably already know what happens in this movie. Uh, so Michael Myers murders his sister on Halloween night when he's just a kid. Fifteen years later, he escapes from a mental institution and stalks the babysitter, Laurie Strode. Dr. Sam Loomis, Michael's psychiatrist, is determined to stop him. But Myers appears to be virtually unstoppable. So there is, to quote that previous uh, reviewer, precious little character or plot development. Um, how do you feel that Halloween spends so much of its time and focus on building that suspense and tension? Uh, does that help draw you into this film? I felt that it was the most interesting part of the film for me. Uh, and I, I really, I understand that reviewer being like, Oh, just kill everybody already. But to me watching it, the way that tension is built with Michael's character, the way that, um, the, the camera is used that makes the audience kind of complicit in, in this whole kind of um, act of murder, because you are so often seeing Michael's literal point of view, um, or the way that that Michael is often framed only sort of like over the shoulder, or, or partly in frame, or you just hear the heavy breathing, or he's in the shadows, or sometimes just standing and staring. That to me is creepy and interesting. And I think still very effective. Most of the other stuff, including the the kills themselves, I it didn't really do a whole lot for me. I, I agree, and I also think that the the character development itself is very very minimal in this. Uh, you learn nothing about Michael Myers as a character, and and it was interesting to compare it to the to the remake where I actually felt they went a little bit deeper. Even when they zoom out and they show the, the two parents saying, Michael, what did you do? And then they stand there for four minutes. It's so flat. Like you, you learn nothing about him. You don't understand anything about his motivation or, or anything. And same with the, the teenagers feel very much like just, oh, you know, play a stereotypical teenager. But the things you mentioned, I think sometimes work well in terms of the, the ominous part of it and kind of like the build up. Uh, although I'm shocked you haven't said anything about the, the shaky cam yet, because there was so much of this and I wrote it down several times. I said, Evan must hate this. You know what? I thought I would. 
Uh, and what what I think that there is a difference I realized and and sort of realized this quite consciously while I was watching it, especially in that very first set of of shots where you are actually seeing child Michael Myers point of view was that there is a difference between handheld and shaky cam. And this was not shaky cam. This was um, sort of a, a new version of steady cam or steady cam technology was was quite new at the time. And I, th- I think they spent like almost a third of the budget on on buying the the rig for this. And so it's it's floaty. It it's sort of it's like watching um like a, a bad steady cam operator now, but it's not um deliberately shaky. It's not like watching Cloverfield or or something like that, um, where the, the camera's all over the place. And because it was sort of gliding and kind of slow enough, I actually didn't mind it that much. And it gave that kind of feeling of like, oh, okay. Again, like we as an audience right now are complicit in this murder. There's nothing that we can do to stop it. Um, something bad is going to happen and we are just on the rails to to watch this. And like I actually thought that it was really effective. Uh, yeah, I think I think especially again, going back to like to your point, Evan, like when you spend most of your budget on that camera, which is a relatively kind of new revelation for them at the time in terms of how you could shoot a scene. You get that first, um, you know, like you said, that shot at the opening of the film where it moves through the house and up the stairs. And uh, there's only one cut in that opening scene because the camera couldn't hold enough film uh, because it's being carried around or whatever. And it could only hold like three minutes or whatever it was of film. So they had to do a cut when uh, uh, Michael Myers puts the mask on and then continues up the stairs. So apparently that was like one of the longest sequences to film. And you're like, okay, this is like at least clever. Like it feels well done Mm -hmm. and interesting to your point. Like I feel like at points it is maybe a little bit overdone at points when they're, you know, um, you f- I feel like there's a lot of repetition of that kind of camera movement or whatever throughout a number of scenes, but like, I don't know for what it was. I, I, I don't mind at all the the way that this is filmed and the way that it looks. And I'll say that, you know, one of the things that they did very well in this is, you know, making use of the darkness to, you know, bring up that tension, make you unsure where Michael Myers is like, you know, where is he hiding? He's hiding in a dark corner. Is he hiding in the dark closet or like a lot of that stuff about how it looks, I thought was actually pretty good and pretty effective at building that tension. I agree um, about the darkness, but I will also say that I have in my notes at one point is like, why isn't anyone turning on the lights? Because there's a whole lot of people just walking around in the dark. Yeah, I'm just going to like wander over to this house to go and check on my friends. And I'm not going to turn on the lights, even just to like to flick the lights on and off to see that if that they work or not. I'm like, yeah. why are you walking around the house in the dark, Lori? Oh, yeah. my God. There turn on a light. A lot, a lot that does not make sense in this movie, like including just like basic things like, hey, I'm I'm babysitting you tonight on Halloween. So, number one, you're a kid and we're not going out trick or treating, even though yeah, you're like nine years old. Sad too. And then number two, the kid's like, hey, can we carve the, the jack-o'-lantern? And At she's nice. like, yeah. Yeah. I know. After Halloween is done, like oh, there's all sorts of stuff that just makes no. And to your point, like the like everybody getting murdered and whatever. OK, not doesn't make sense. Why don't you just run away? Like apparently it's like in theaters, people will, were yelling at Lori like, stop dropping the knife. Take the yeah. knife with you. <laughs> don't sit down and turn your back on the killer who's already come back to life. Yeah, like four times. Right. So, I mean, I think there's a lot that doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, Dr. Loomis uh, just hanging outside of the Myers house all night until he just turns around. And he's like, like, oh, look at that car. Maybe I'll just start running up and down the street. Like, well, he does just, get to terrify some children and then be pretty happy about it. He was very delighted. I, I will say I heard a, del- a delightful story. I think it's delightful that uh, Donald Pleasance, who like he's a successful actor, right? Like he'd been in James Bond movies. He'd been in uh, The Great Escape, like a notable actor. Uh, 
when he was so frustrated and angry that he had to stoop to being in a film like this, that apparently uh, on the nights he was there shooting, he'd be like two bottles of wine in oh, before whoa. he'd actually start recording the scene. So like that opening bit with him driving up the up the road with the nurse in the car, he was like literally like came out of his trailer at least two bottles of wine in before recording like oh boy i mean i wouldn't have i didn't know it until i did some research but apparently he was pretty unhappy to be there so and yet he he reprises the role like what five times or something like that yeah yeah he's in a bunch of the sequels and yeah yeah Uh, i just there's not a lot that makes sense about this movie when you really stop i mean it, it, it also introduces some of those tropes about like you know the killer who doesn't seem to move faster than a slow dawdle. Like, okay, cool. Michael Myers doesn't run, even though in the first scene he climbs on top of a car and then jumps off and runs inside. Like it's very inconsistent with any of its logic, Um, but it looks creepy. And yet does, does any of that matter? Because people ate it up and still continue to. Do they though? Because like I only watch this because this was a thing. It was like a homework assignment. So I don't, I'm not sure that people eat it up still. Um, I think that there's so much about this that's incredibly important for future movies, current movies, recent ones. But this movie itself, I don't think anyone's eating it up as a, you know, other than possibly you pick up a leftover from the fridge and you go, oh, oh, that's a week old. I shouldn't have eaten that. I shouldn't have eaten 96% of that rotten tomato. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think one of the things just going back to it is, uh, you know, this is a, a movie that launches a bunch of careers, including Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, this is her first film. She gets cast in this movie when basically they realize who her parents are because up till that point, she was kind of this unknown, but suddenly when they realize that she's Janet Lee and Tony Curtis's daughter, uh, Janet Lee, most famous for being in psycho. They're like, Oh my God, get her in the movie. Of course she, she, she's gotta be in here. Um, I'm, I'm curious, did, did her performance or any of the other performances uh, in this film stand out for you? Um, I think that the performances stood out to me in how poor the performances are. Um, I, I do have it written down in a number of places, just like the the adults playing these teenagers are not good. Like there, there, there is no MVP in the, you know what, but you know who, who is an MVP in this, uh, Nick Castle as, uh, as Michael Myers, um, he, he, to me, is the MVP uh, with uh, Donald Pleasance, uh, I'd say, is my solid number two. But um, yeah, you know, I for me, like the, the moment that that Jamie Lee Curtis's role came alive was actually when she was like running from the house screaming and trying to get into the other houses. I'm like, oh, OK, yeah. so this is this seems like some interesting acting. Otherwise, I mean, everything's just kind of flat and pat and just that is not a it is not a, a well-acted film yeah i think this but so hard to to tell uh, apart because i think it is poorly written i think it's very poorly directed and with those two things it's hard to kind of like say how much of that is poor acting i have a feeling there's a lot of poor acting going on but it's really hard to to separate it out from the the directing and the writing because what do you do with some of those lines what do you do with some of the possible instructions to kind of say, oh, I want you to do more of this. So it, it's hard for me to say. What I can say is it, it was not convincing. And I think it was a combination, a perfect storm of those things that the directing, the writing and the acting that that just kind of makes it very unconvincing. I'll give you the I'll give you the writing. Um and and I, you know, I I think that they wrote this in like 10 days or three weeks or something. So I mean it was very quick. But like I actually think that directing is it is is interesting, like genuinely yeah, interesting. I agree. Yeah. It, sorry, it's a good point. The what I meant was the directing in the sense of what the director would have said to them. Here's what I want from you out of this scene, as opposed to sort of more of the the cinematography and how do I want to kind of frame this sequence. I, I, I was referring to like what does the director say? Here's what I want you to do in this moment. I want you to act this way. 
I have a feeling that was probably not very helpful for some of these actors uh, at that time. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the things I find fascinating about this movie is just how many people on this movie uh, were like friends and family. Uh, They'd all done small, you know, productions on other films and stuff. So a number of the actors uh, were also like in charge of wardrobe. And uh, some of the folks who um, at one point, um, uh, like the guy who's in charge of, you know, props and all that kind of stuff uh, also becomes like the film's editor. And so like, it's, it's just like such a, like, how do we get this done for this you know, low budget. Um, Nick Castle, who's playing Michael Myers, was apparently getting paid like 20 bucks a day or something like that to become, you know, one of the most memorable, uh, you know, murderous. Iconic villains. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and I think maybe that's a good point to stop and just come back and maybe talk a little bit about Michael Myers uh, and, uh, you know, this iconic villain that he has become. So Michael Myers, uh, I mean, Michael Myers gets his start when they found a Captain Kirk mask. They shaved off a bunch of the hair, painted the face bright white, the hair jet black. uh, And I will say it's a pretty creepy mask. Uh, I'm curious about from both of you, like, do you think Michael Myers is both an effective and or interesting villain? Yes, I think that. Michael Myers is incredibly effective and really interesting because he is largely a blank canvas, Um, because he just sort of stands and looms and stares and breathes. He is something that you just project all your fear onto. And and I think that that one of the reasons why he has become so iconic is because you can project all your fear onto him. And because there's that B story with with Dr. Loomis, which honestly, like, do you need all of the Sam Loomis stuff? I mean, you could argue no, but I think that it is because he is constantly creating the myth of Michael Myers within the movie itself and mythologizing who and what Michael Myers is that Michael Myers then becomes larger than the film itself. Because when you right off the jump, you're like, just whatever you do, be careful around it. And, you know, the nurse is like, don't you mean he? And, you know, he's a man. And, Guys, like, yeah, whatever kind of thing. And it's like, okay, so you're already dehumanizing him, yeah, which is really interesting. And then you go on these monologues about how you've, you know, stared into the eyes of of the black eyes of evil and that this inhuman patience has just been waiting for this, you know, silent alarm to go off and for him to come to this very night. And so there is this real sense of, um, Fate, which the high school teacher talks about, and it's, yep. it, really know, leans we, into, yeah, which, yeah, which we we get, you know, in Hereditary as well, is where the you know the high school teacher gives away like kind of the film, um, but yeah, it's it, I think it's because Michael Myers is so blank and just stares and looms and wanders that Michael Myers has become such an iconic villain. I agree that he's an incredible villain for this. It's a little bit like, you know, when you first meet Darth Vader in the first Star Wars movie, you don't need to know anything about him. You don't need to know his backstory. You don't need to have watched the the nine seasons uh, of Clone Wars to understand the transition for him to become Darth Vader. He is just scary in that moment. You go exactly what you said. You can kind of project all of your things on this person that you know, this is a scary dangerous person. From that perspective, I think he works really, really well. It's whenever you try to do something more with it to say, yeah, but why is he so angry? That's kind of when it falls apart. Okay. I I think we do need to agree that Michael Myers has really bad aim. Like he takes a couple shots at Lori and misses by a mile. He stabs the couch. He ruins a shirt 
but with no discernible damage. Like that part is a little upsetting for me that the villain who's just wiped out a bunch of other teenagers is missing so profoundly badly. So I'm not going to uh, try to play apologetics here, but there uh, is something interesting in that Michael is obsessed with Lori Um you know, especially after seeing her from the house and uh, and with a with a kid who does look a little bit like he did as a kid as well. And mm-hmm. so, like, you know, there's this kind of like, I don't know, maybe he's like mapping uh, his own sister who he murdered onto Lori. And so there is that sort of like psychosexual obsession. Um, but Lori is you know, that that trope of like the good girl who they, who ends up being the final girl. Right. And because she hasn't sort of slept with anyone, you know, because she isn't romantically involved with anyone, she is still childlike. And we know that Michael Myers doesn't kill kids. He had a you know, he he pushed a kid away uh, at one point and and, you know, follows the the kid that uh, she, that Lori babysits, but then doesn't like murder that kid. That maybe there's something in him that is keeping him from full on like murdering Lori because um, she hasn't sort of like, I don't know, sullied herself or, you know, hasn't had sex. So that isn't the death of innocence in her. I'm just, I'm doing a a very different reading on this. You just put a lot more thought and effort into that than anybody else involved with the writing, production, (laughs) direction, (laughs) acting, or anything else in this movie. I'm just saying. I don't know, because there is a real sort of theme of sex and death in this movie, and very overtly sex and death. But like, you see Michael a lot, um, like around bedsheets, uh, you know, either under them or around them. And so you get this sense of like sex because bed, but also like a death shroud. Uh, and, you know, it, it, he does the full like ghost in sheet thing. And the reason that we ghosts are in sheets is because that's they're supposed to be the body's death shroud that they're walking around in. And even when people call on the phone and they're being killed, like all of the sounds of the ladies being killed in this film uh are pretty sexy sounds for for killing so yeah i don't know maybe maybe there is some thought there uh one of the perhaps best well known things coming out of this movie besides i guess michael myers himself is uh john carpenter's score for this movie um how impactful was his scoring um to to this film and and adding that creep factor to it i remember at the time when i when I first heard and learned that he actually did his own scoring for movies uh, as a kid, I was so impressed. I was like, wow, he can do both. And I think it was at an age where it just blew me away. At this stage now, when I listened to it for the first time, I think he probably should have left it to someone else because I I thought, sure, it's iconic in the way that it repeats certain things, but they're not very good things to repeat. Like I, I didn't think that it was really interesting notes uh, or or music around it. So I, it actually didn't do much for me. I, I think he probably should have given this to someone else. I disagree. And I actually disagree really strongly. I think that that this theme that he did is fantastic. I love how um, you've got these this repeating theme that that never resolves. And because it doesn't resolve, that builds tension. I think it is perfect part and parcel with, with this film. Like, you know, at some points it sounds like kind of like reverse jaws, like rather than da da, it's like da 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 da. And it just keeps dropping in like, in, in like modulation. And it's like, Oh damn, like this is, this is really good. This is sucking me into the film. So yeah, agree to disagree on on that point. 
I'll, I'll probably land somewhere in between the two of you because I think the the music is actually really good. I mean, it, it reminds me a lot. We talked about it during our Exorcist episode, two, two bells on that one, uh, where it's just it is a very, you know, iconic piece of music that you definitely recognize. I think to steal Michael's term, there, it, this is a bit of a reverse exorcist though, where when we talked about it from the exorcist, we said how little it was used in that film. Uh, whereas here it is good, but it is way overused. And so when you hear it again and again and again, and especially because there is none of the, um, payoffs that resolve as the pen tension kind of builds up until the very last 20 minutes or whatever. Um, when you keep hearing that, like, like, and then nothing happens, you're like, it's just, a, he's just standing there. Like, this is the wrong music. Like I need different music that builds up because it's kind of consistently the same music throughout the same kind of stings or whatever that come in the same. Uh, so it, as much as it's good, it's way overused. And I get that he had like, three days to score this movie and then they had to like you know edit it and get the music inserted and every I, I i get it but it's just it's way overused even though it is very iconic okay but i think what we can all kind of agree like that the, i mean the whole movie itself super iconic in that it it sets the the prototypes for like slasher films for for decades to come i mean what what do you think what do you think was in this film that really kind of set the stage for this genre in a way that that, you know, I guess Psycho or Black Christmas before it didn't really sort of catch fire with it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things about it is I mean, I just kind of set it up top like you have all the tropes here, right, that you see in the slasher movies over the years. I think there's a, a little bit of that, like. Not being an adult at the time, I couldn't tell you for sure, but that like that feeling of like late seventies going into the eighties of like crime and just like there's people mm. who are just out there who are going to kill you for no reason because there's crime everywhere. And like I feel like part of that kind of era gets kicked off with all of these killers who are just out there killing because they can and you know, nonsensical violence. So I definitely think it ties into some of the um, like societal themes that are going on at that point that help kind of build the genre and build, build this kind of style of movie. This being one of the early ones, I think this helps, you know, as that, that maybe phenomenon catches on. And I think this is a good, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested to see what a teenager today would think of this because, you know, I, I don't, I think this is a teen type movie. And so the idea of playing it into, um, teenagers who are doing teenage things or what teenagers think they want to be doing, who are also then becoming the victim of this murder is, um, I think it makes a lot of sense when you want box office success and that's your target demographic and that kind of thing. So I think kind of laying it out is like, all right, teenagers, they're having drinks, they're having sex, and then they're getting murdered by this, you know, unstoppable force of evil is I think kind of compelling when you're younger, maybe not as much as three older dudes talking about it. But I think that kind of like teen exploitation kind of thing um, makes a lot of sense to, you know, younger folks. And I think that's part of why that that kind of became an enduring part of these these kind of setups. Right. It's not ever like 50 year olds being chased by these unstoppable killers. Oh, it's, my hip. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I fell down because my hip gave way and now my, I definitely can't get up. And the shuffling killer has caught me. I also think like the you, you have to separate the, the notion of like there's some themes for sure that have been enduring. And like we've talked about a few other movies, how critical they are for uh, developing the genres today, where they are today. I would not go back and watch some of the original uh, Romero's zombie movies today. I don't think I would enjoy it at all. Yet, where would we be today if they didn't exist? And what what have we been able to do to kind of drive that forward and play with the concepts and, and the ideas? Like, I think that's incredibly powerful. So I think you have to separate it and say, this movie, sure, it did all of these things on its own today. And this is where I think we have to be very honest with people because I hadn't seen it before. If anyone else is out there and they haven't watched it before, I would say, please, please do yourself a favor, do something different. 
unless for purely academic purposes you want to analyze this thing, stay away. Yet at the same time, acknowledge that this is an incredibly important movie for driving an entire genre of, of films forward for the future. And I think that you need to be able to acknowledge both. Yeah, I think that that to to both of your points, you know, in terms of this being kind of the prototype for an entire subgenre, I wonder if it is because it is so primal. It is sex, so it's it's titillating, uh, you know, and it is death. Um, and from a purely like box office and like business point of view, it is cheap because all you need is a knife and, uh, you know, it, because it's a slasher, it's a, it's a human. You're not making a monster movie. You don't need big special effects. You just need, you know, the implement of death, the scary killer that you can easily just like, you know, throw a mask on or, you know, sh have a shadow face and then just have a lot of really sexy teenagers being sexy and getting murdered one by one. And that's enough to make a lot of people go to the theater. So it's cheap and it is exciting it for you know that it just punches you right in the the lizard brain and uh and it and it makes money and maybe that's why we just see it over and over and over again in various levels of uh exploitation well uh, absolutely and i think that's also why by the time you hit you know, the nineties, uh, that's why you have like scream that comes along and kind of flips this equation on its head. Right. Because it's like, okay, we've done this. We've done it a whole bunch of times. We've done it all the different ways. And maybe this whole thing about just like killers killing for no particular reason and it's cheap and it's low budget and like all, all this kind of schlockiness to it. It's like, yeah, okay. May maybe it's time we update this, but like there's a good solid what 18 years or whatever that winds up being until mm -hmm. scream comes out where it's basically I mean, 20 years. Yeah. This is the, uh, this is, is the point like 97, 98. I think it was 95 or 96. Yeah. Really that early. Dang. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's exactly why you kind of need scream and a bit of a reinjection into the, the, the style of movie because, you know, by that point, we're kind of operating in this different thing. I, I, I do think that kind of those societal um, trends or whatever, like crime isn't the same kind of thing by the late 90s as it was in like the late 70s. Like, I don't know. I think some of those changes kind of happen over those next 20 years. But I mean, it's like you're saying, like, it's easy to see. And like when you have this kind of success from a cheap, low budget, self, self, in, independent, you know, uh, film, it's easy to see why you get a whole bunch of of copycats, and there are a lot of copycats over the next while. But I, I, I think this brings us to the point where I ask the most important question of all, and I don't think there's going to be any surprises tonight. Um, would you recommend this movie to somebody who hasn't seen it? Absolutely not. I, I would really go out of my way to make sure they don't do it. They might say to me, okay, cool. I, I, I won't watch it. And I'm going to be like following up later. Hey, you, you meant it, right? Like you're not going to watch it. I'm going to be texting them. I'm going to be calling them. I'm going to be following up Hourly the next check -ins day. check-ins to make sure they're this safe. Because it's like friends, friends don't do this to each other. So I, I would say no. I feel like uh, I feel like you start making it taboo, and they're they're just going to want to watch it. All to the see kids what are going to flock to about. it again. Yeah, you know that's that's what's going to happen, Michael. You 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 made Halloween cool again. I, I can say I probably wouldn't recommend this to anybody who hasn't seen it. Uh, I mean, there's better scarier movies I, I i like both of you i think uh, you know slashers are not my favorite style i think there's some that are okay and enjoyable but um this isn't it for me but evan what about you like is this something that you would recommend to folks i mean yeah if you are looking at it from that academic point of view it's it's like you said it's not particularly scary um it's not a particularly like good movie, but it has some really interesting things in it and it's good to know your primary sources. Um, 
so I'd recommend it in in that way. Um, but like, yeah, you, you know, the, the if there are other things to watch for sure. Um, I'm guessing I know the answer to this one as well. But either of you going to revisit this? Nah, nah. You, Chris? Uh, and I'm pretty uh, solid. Nope as well so um i think that's a good place to call it uh clearly we did not love halloween even though it is halloween and i hope you're all having a wonderful scary time yourselves and that's what we thought about halloween so we'd love to know what you thought uh you can always email us at how did you miss this at gmail uh and you can send us any questions or thoughts you might have about the stuff that we are watching uh if you enjoy what we're doing here do us a favor take a second to rate review subscribe wherever you happen to be listening uh and we will be with you again next week when we're going to be wrapping up scaretober and deciding which movies actually gave us a scare and which ones should have stayed missed Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you then. Six Degrees of Lost Boys. Here we go. Halloween has Jamie Lee Curtis, who is in Trading Places with Dan Aykroyd, who is in My Girl with Macaulay Culkin, who is in Home Alone 2, Lost in New York with Kiefer Sutherland, who is in The Lost Boys. Oh man, this was, that was hard. That was a real stretch. I had to go real deep. Kiefer Sutherland was in Home Alone 2? Wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and there is the wrap up. <laughs> that is brilliant. <laughs>